Thank you. The, uh, the segue about Americans and gun laws was a really nice kind of connecting bridge to me. Um, as you can hear my voice, I'm American. Um, so my title on a normal basis is Critical Futurist. Today will be a little less future, a little bit more critique. Um, and you know, I, I, this is a really interesting space. As Hannes mentioned, I, I write for a number of publications and wrote an article beginning of last summer sort of saying, the sharing economy isn't really sharing with you. Uh, and we've seen a lot of things happen in this economy over the past 12 to 18 months. Uh, so I want to kind of take a look at that, pick it apart a little bit, uh, look at some of the alternatives that we have in front of us uh, and see where we go. But it's important to really start with a kind of warm, fuzzy, puppy picture. Um, those of you who are young, a long time ago, we used to have a thing called sharing. Uh, and um, it was really crazy. We actually, if we had a thing that we thought someone else might like, we might walk over to them and say, hey, I've got something, would you care for a piece of this? Uh, would you like to taste this? I want you to hear this song that I'm listening to. Um, I have a spare bedroom. If you're in town tonight, feel free to come by and use it. Um, we you know, had a very much kind of informal, um, I know you may gasp, face-to-face, uh, definition of this uh, in the, the kind of pre-sharing economy in scare quotes uh, era. Uh, and this word sharing, uh, I think, has been appropriated, uh, stretched and pulled uh, and torn in a lot of different directions to mean a lot of different things. And I think that may be one of the things that's kind of at the root of the issue right now and why we even talk about the idea of a backlash. Um, and it's disentangling this rhetoric of sharing. You know, what is sharing? What is an exchange of value? Is it offering something to someone based on goodwill? Uh, is it an interpersonal connection of the kind that Joel was talking about trying to, to scale? Uh, is it about making sure that we monetize all the things uh, or that we actually build something that we need right now at this critical moment uh, in our economic lives? So if you do a basic search, um, you're going to get confused. Um, you find all these different terms uh, floating around out there. We have um, the broad sharing economy. It's kind of a, a rhetorical trap that's difficult to escape. It's the only thing we have right now to use to, to refer uh, to this phenomenon. We have the peer-to-peer -peer economy. Uh, partly comes out of the, the kind of movement towards uh, using technology, using networks to establish uh, a very kind of flat, non-hierarchical peer-to-peer economy or economies around the world. Um, somebody came along, snipped the first piece of that off, sold it online, and just left us with peer economy. Uh, Stephen Johnson writes about peer progressivism in his book, Future Perfect, from the last couple of years. Uh, Rachel Botsman wrote a book uh, recently with uh, Rue Reynolds, actually a couple of years ago, talking about the collaborative economy. We have collaborative consumption. Um, we have now, more recently, the gig economy that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, that sounds a little bit scary. Uh, and Rachel even took to uh, a presentation recently to actually kind of attempt to disambiguate all of these terms. Uh, and when I look at that from the outside, I think if you're going to have to have a presentation to explain what all of these little niches mean, um, then we might have a problem. Uh, so, uh, and then of course now we're finding that it's being swept up again into an even larger bucket called civic technology uh, that I'll talk about in a couple of seconds. So, the one example people give you, if you say sharing economy, they'll say, oh, bike sharing. How many of you have used bike sharing services? You come from a place with bike sharing services. I'm envious. Um, we don't have bikes where I come from. Um, bike sharing services, I look at those and I think, is this really sharing? They're a wonderful thing. They're, they're a, a fabulous kind of new amenity on the face of some of the largest cities. Um, but if you really think about it, what is it exactly? Are you actually sharing a bike that someone else owns? Who owns these bike sharing systems? The bike sharing systems are called bike sharing systems because they're owned in large part by either commercial or large nonprofit entities. Uh, they are owned by someone else and they are lent to you. It's a, f a different kind of public transportation in effect. It's great that we have them. Technology has enabled this. It's fantastic. Uh, I would encourage more cities to take them up, but I don't know that it actually is a good definition of what we call the sharing economy. Um, a couple of these companies are, or organizations are in trouble right now financially. Some of them are, are finding sponsorship being pulled back after a couple of years of pilots that have not gone so well uh, or not generated the kind of revenue and profitability that they need. 
when those bikes go away, suddenly something's not being shared with you anymore. So I think that's kind of a, a proof point uh, as to whether or not we can accurately apply the words sharing economy to bike sharing. Car sharing. Car sharing was going to be another tremendous business. We were all going to buy fewer vehicles, um, according to, to kind of industry marketing, and reallocate those vehicles amongst us to use. Um, some of the earliest movers in these spaces were purchased. Zipcar, uh, bought by Avis. Zimride, bought by Enterprise. Um, there's a reason for that, because they cracked something that's quite difficult, which is a, a kind of newer wave of logistical management that allows them to figure out how to move these complex assets around complex systems, cities, to meet the just-in-time needs of people. That sounds like a business pitch. It is a business pitch. It doesn't sound like, to me, a kind of organic, bottom-up, social economy. Um, some of the, the services that are used to actually allow you to share your own car with someone else, they've either not done so well, or in some cases, they've actually just stayed restricted to a few markets where it actually sticks, uh, where the service makes sense, uh, the geography makes sense for these types of services, uh, the demography makes sense for these types of services. I can't imagine a car sharing, a ride sharing service doing very well in a community where the age profile is 50, 60, 70 years old. There will always be exceptions to that rule, but I can't see it happening. So there are reasons why they work in some places, but doesn't scale. This is the example that, of course, Arnaud was talking about at the very beginning, the idea of uh, sharing rooms, sharing uh, facilities, sharing housing, sharing uh, flats, chalets, apartments, uh, airstreams, uh, boats, lofts, you name it. We found a way to share just about every kind of physical space, but in effect, what's really happening as these services try to grow, and, and as Arnaud talked about, trying to actually reach up uh, scale to a, a national or global size, um, is that they effectively become uh, space as a service. So that's great. Space as a service is an innovation. It's a new industry, it's a new market. Uh, it's just-in-time reallocation of undervalued assets. But I wonder if that's really what we want to get at uh, under the, the kind of heading of sharing economy. Um, and in particular, the idea of trying to scale this to hundreds of thousands, millions of rooms in multiple countries. Joel just talked about this example, the idea of sharing food. Um, sharing leftovers, there's a startup for that. Somebody's come out already, I think, in the US and maybe in the UK with something called leftover swap. Um, sorry, I'm hearing like sounds of discomfort. It is after lunch, but there's leftover swap. Leftover swap is a system I really don't think is going to scale that well, um, at least not to a sort of national level. We talked earlier about, you know, we want to be the McDonald's of. Uh, it's kind of difficult to be the McDonald's of leftovers, or maybe that's kind of a circular problem. Somebody will work it out. There's a lot of entrepreneurs here. Um, but again, it's sort of an efficient allocation of resources, you know, getting closer to um, delivery of an experience, because as Joel pointed out, food and experience, social experience go together. What did we do last night, a lot of us? We sat hundreds of us in a room around buckets of molten cheese, delicious, delicious molten cheese, and at the fondue, and had a social experience. Um, that wasn't something we necessarily had to, you know, book online, see if it would scale, take it to other cities, brand it, and uh, find an exit strategy for the VCs. Um, so this is no small market, or markets, or bunches of markets. Uh, this is actually some data recently gathered by Knight Foundation. Uh, and Knight Foundation was looking not at the sharing economy per se, they were looking at what they were calling civic technology. Um, things that are being developed, new innovations that are being developed to help cities run better and run better in ways that are relevant to their local economy. I found it very telling that they swept all of peer-to-peer -peer sharing organizations into this report, which was expressly about um, the investment strategies of these companies. And money is not bad, capitalism is not bad, investment is not bad. But again, I think it's sort of a, it's a way, way marker, sort of signpost as to where we're taking this warm, fuzzy word sharing that we used to actually care about and dragging it off uh, into a different direction. And um, that gives us the new business plan. Uh, this is kind of a snow clone, if you know what that term is, but the idea that, you know, if you go up to somebody now and you can say, well, we're the blank for blank. So just insert one uh, noun here at the beginning and uh, 
a kind of, or a brand at the beginning and a kind of tedious task at the end. Um, Ian Bargos, I think, wherever you are, you've suggested one about 30 minutes ago. It's like uh, Uber, but for snow plows. And you hear people say this. There are articles being written about it now. Um, oh, yeah, we are like this for that. Um, it's kind of become this description startup game. So don't worry about the business model canvas. Just take a picture of this, show it. They'll give you money. It's all you need. But in the middle of all this kind of discussion of scaling, uh, and becoming multi-billion dollar industries. And when you look at the amount of money that's been invested in so-called sharing platforms, it's well over a billion dollars in venture capital. The valuations of some of the largest companies that we know, Airbnb or Uber, are in the, the multiples of billions of dollars heading towards uh, uh, you know, potential IPOs in the next couple of years. Uh, and yet, you know, something else has happened. There's a reason why this is actually happening now, and it's a confluence of the types of technologies that are used to actually run these platforms, to, to collect, identify, aggregate, price, package, and deliver access to all of these millions and millions of, of poorly allocated assets. They're poorly allocated in part because the economy fell apart around 2007, 8, 9. Um, and people you know, need money, they need value. If you're living in a home where you're underwater on your mortgage, you've got to find some way to stay in that home. So you might want to rent out a room. Um, if you are unemployed or needing a third, fourth, or fifth job, as some people I know do, um, you may want to, you know, cook dinner and sell access to that. Um, it's a perfectly sensible thing to do, but there's also been a kind of upward pressure from the bottom, people needing an opportunity to do things. So we've kind of come to this point where technology meets this kind of fracturing of capitalism uh, and has created this sort of opportunity. Some people have you know, taken it upon themselves to, to create small solutions. This is actually um, a fair sharing uh, scheme that was run temporarily. I believe this one's not from New York, but it happened on the MTA in New York City as well when the fares were hiked. Um, share your fare, people actually loading an, an, a, uh, a fare card, swiping it, and then handing it up back through the turnstiles to other people uh, to make sure that they were right there on the spot to give them the fare that they needed. Um, this kind of gives you an indication that people uh, are you know, feeling a need, wanting to do something, but not really quite sure how. So we've got this kind of bottom-up um, kind of need and demand emerging, and we've also got this massive top-down system, and we're becoming very good right now at weaponizing so-called sharing, uh, at, at creating something out of it that can scale to a large business, in theory. Um, Tom Slay, who's a writer uh, in Canada, has written recently an article that um, he was writing at about the same time I'm putting the presentation together, and we seem to kind of have a mind meld. Tom was talking about um, two different models that are emerging, and his uh, characterization of it, which I don't disagree with, is kind of a European model versus an American model. First, we'll take a look at the American-ish model. Um, most of you will recognize uh, this company, Uber. It's uh, come in, really shaken up the taxi business, really shaken up the kind of transportation business, uh, and uh, essentially, you know, turn this into a kind of hypermarket at high speed, hyperminimization, market making in its truest sense. Um, again, the term sharing economy is attached to that, but I don't think it actually really works that way. Um, talking about a three and a half billion dollar valuation, revenues of 125 million. TaskRabbit. I really should have taken some spray paint and changed that to just wear all the product. TaskRabbit, uh, if you're not familiar with, is an organization that has is, is, uh, emerged to take people, uh, a poorly allocated asset, people who have time and perhaps a skill and want to make money, and attach them to uh, people who can actually uh, use them. Uh, but what we end up with is not markets made by people, but markets made up of people. Um, again, taking people and using them as an asset to, to kind of accelerate over time. So this is actually somebody from TaskRabbit being used to stand in line uh, to wait for the iPhone 5. I really don't think this is where we wanted the economy to be in the future. Um, it's good that, that, that somebody has found some way to make money temporarily. It's good that somebody else has found someone not to, so they don't have to stand and freeze at night and can wait outside. But this isn't the new economy that we've been told about. And then there's the problem of trust and verification. It's difficult to scale. We've gone from, I trust you, you're my friend, you're my neighbor, as Joel talked about, verifying people in one city. It's quite difficult to do that on a national basis or an international basis. 
So the sharing economy is now beginning to kind of grow an arm that looks like a credit bureau. I don't really feel like that's kind of consonant with the idea of sharing in the sense that we've known. Um, and then lastly, the technology has actually emerged to allow us to do this. This is actually from an interview with Evan Williams of Twitter a few years ago, or last year, that Dan Hill, uh, the designer and urbanist, uh, talked about in a, in a really excellent article about Uber and public transportation. Uh, and Evan said, basically, you know, reducing the internet to a giant machine to give us people what they want. Um, again, I don't feel like that's kind of in line with what we thought of as being the idea of the sharing economy. We have um, you know, APIs, signups, we know how to do buttons, lists, responsive layouts, uh, Dan wrote, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean we need to slap it on something that's really kind of a smaller transaction. So we have faster markets, higher speed, people, rooms, food, cars, etc., kind of being rocketed along as quickly as possible to increase turnover and attempt to scale. And these are some of the things that happen. Again, this is an anecdote. This is a guy who actually wrote an article about how he was smart enough to buy uh, an apartment and rent it out on Airbnb. Um, that becomes a kind of like property flipping business, a way to, to uh, you know, generate income from getting as many people through your house as possible, not really the idea of, hey, I've got a bed, I've got a couch, I'll share with you. Um, you may be familiar with this incident recently from Paris. Uh, where Parisian tax driver, taxi drivers uh, took it upon themselves to extract a little vigilante justice, attacked uh, at least one Uber vehicle, flattened the tires, went after the windows, etc. cetera. Um, so it's not just me. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't recommend doing this. But I think that it's, it's sort of indicative of a sentiment that's building. Um, and then this kind of DDoS attack of Uber drivers calling uh, drivers from another competitive service, booking rides and canceling them. We've gone too far. That's where I think we draw the line. So, but the, the city examples I think are really, really interesting. I spent a lot of time last summer in Barcelona um, looking at, uh, or teaching some students from a Masters of Design program. And in that program, we actually tried to develop models for a very localized sharing economy. Barcelona is a really interesting example in that it has probably more sharing economy models per square meter in that city uh, of anywhere. It has creativity, it has people, it's a wonderful destination to come to, people want to visit there, but it also has a, a true kind of organic spirit of re local resilience and helping out. Uh, local economies are getting control and sharing what they have, and also delivering the type of experience, it's no accident that Eat With started in Barcelona. 6.6% um, uh, tourism growth last year in, just Catal uh, in Spain. Uh, Catalonia has a billion plus, um, Sorry, sorry, Spain has a billion plus overnight stays last year, but only 600,000 of those uh, were actual hotels. Um, so this economy is kind of growing quite quickly into the informal sense, and it's always sort of been that way there. But the government is saying, look, we need to actually kind of sit down, have a discussion, figure out how we develop regulation, um, how we modify the tax system to actually be useful so that we can still keep that business, still keep things happening here in Barcelona, uh, but not have it all kind of escape and go offshore. In Greece, a tremendous example, totally devastated after the 2008 economic collapse. Um, this is a wonderful article that was in the New York Times a couple of days ago. I recommend you look at it. Uh, and it's about what they've called the potato revolution, about local farmers uh, actually getting rid of the middleman and reconstructing the types of local farm co-ops that we used to talk about and we used to have. And this one farmer basically said, our goal is not to destroy the old market system, but just to slow it down, to slow down that velocity and get it to change. Um, Barcelona, Greece, Amsterdam, another fantastic example, the mayor of Amsterdam deciding to, to work with companies, with groups in the city, to try to figure out what it is interesting about Amsterdam that people like. To take that friction that we love about Amsterdam, not necessarily scale it globally, I'm not sure that we want to scale Amsterdam globally, maybe we do. Um, but uh, to, to find what's unique there, build a localized sharing economy around it, uh, and um, have people come there and experience it locally. Again, not to scale, not to flip, not to sell out, um, but to build an economic system that's useful for people there. So I think looking forward, and we've kind of seen it in these two presentations prior to me this morning, this afternoon, we have two different options kind of facing us. On the one end of the spectrum, this is not a, a binary choice, but it's it's kind of two ends of the spectrum. We have the positioning of people as consumers or as assets, um, an extraction 
based economy where we're actually trying to yield as much value from all of those assets as possible, scale quickly, do so efficiently, and efficiency means eliminating regulation, lowering taxes, all of those things that are considered to be a bump in the road on the free market end of the, the spectrum. Um, go after it in terms of competition and disruption and not actually building local value, and go for velocity. Whereas on the other side, we're talking about people as citizens. What's relevant for an individual city? What's relevant for an individual community? Delivering experiences and actually allowing people to, to come and spend time with you and have a social connection. Um, going for depth over scale. Um, creating some engagement, developing cooperation, and actually delivering long-term value that can be transmitted forward over time uh, and not trying to kind of extract value as quickly as possible out of those economies. So these are the two kind of ends of the spectrum I think we face. When we start to talk about where we want sharing economy to go going forward, um, I would submit that these are the kind of ends of the line that we want to decide which where do we want to be with or how do we want to fuse the two together. Thank you.